But what I'd like to talk about today is what GraphQL was before GraphQL. Because I feel like at this point, the story of GraphQL, we've told it a bunch of times. You know, we've told that story of the initial prototype uh, in February of 2012 and you know, hacking in the corner and trying to figure out what this was going to be and eventually shipping it in the iOS app in August, uh, the open sourcing in July of 2015, and then, of course, where we are today. But the story that we haven't told quite as much and the story that I think is really important to understand GraphQL and why it exists and a lot of the decisions we made is that prehistory. It's the, you know, probably four plus years leading up to 2012 because a lot of the architectural decisions we made there really made GraphQL possible. And if you look at GraphQL today, you can see the effects of those decisions on the technology and on the way it operates. And so before I dive into this, I do want to caution. This is not the one true way of using GraphQL. This is not the way to do it, and if you're not doing it, that's crazy. This just happens to be the Facebook server ar architecture in 2012. But the reason I think it's worth talking about is this was the Facebook server architecture in 2012. GraphQL was built for this architecture. And more importantly, I think there are some good ideas in here, some ideas that I think were good in 2012, some ideas that I think are good today, and some ideas that I think really sort of transcend just building a GraphQL server at Facebook in 2012 to building things in general. So that was a little bit abstract. Oh, these are going to be some good ideas. If you're working with GraphQL today, why does this matter at all? Like, what sort of things in GraphQL does this inform? Well, I'm going to go back a little bit to philosophy, because I actually think this philosophy really resonates with me, and I think it sort of explains some of how GraphQL operates. You know, there's a quote from Doug McElroy. Uh, this is the Unix philosophy, write programs that do one thing and do it well, write programs to work together. And when I think about the way that GraphQL operates at Facebook, and when I think about the way that almost the spec is designed, there are a lot of questions that it very specifically does not answer. It does not have a canonical way of doing authorization or efficiency or caching or rate limiting, which are all really, really important questions. And it's not that it ignores these, it just doesn't address them. And the reason why it doesn't address them is because these were already answered by Facebook server architecture in 2012. And so these concerns were not specific to GraphQL. GraphQL was not designed to solve these. GraphQL was designed to compose with a solution for these that we anticipate would either already exist or that you could bring into existence. And so that's a little bit why I want to talk about this era, because it does help answer all of those questions and explains how we were able to answer them without GraphQL and therefore how GraphQL was able to evolve as you know, a rather small piece of technology in the stack, one that's critical, but one that doesn't necessarily try and answer every question. It tries to answer one question and one question well. And when I think about this era at Facebook, I really think of three key architectural developments, three key principles that both informed how we built things and that we emerged with from building things. And those are these three. This idea that data requirements form a tree. The idea that you need to design around asynchronicity and our desire to strive for single sources of truth. I'm going to walk through all three of these and give an example of how this emerged in Facebook and really build up that stack in a way that hopefully by the end you'll be looking and saying, oh, I can see how GraphQL emerged from this. So let's start with the first one, this idea that data requirements form a tree. And throughout this whole example, or the whole presentation, I want to have an example. I want to make sure we're building something concrete. So this is a very, very basic sample app. Uh, it is a sample app that has a user, and it has a best friend, and it has a list of friends and their best friends, and I don't think I'm giving anything away here. Uh, I'll have Lee do a polish pass on it at some point. But this is the initial working design. It's at least functional. And if we were going to try and build this, you know, how would we do it? Well, we might just say, let's throw it onto a SQL table. And we'll query the data, and then we'll build the view from there. And it would look something like this. You know, we're going to fetch the user's name. We'll fetch their friends. We'll fetch their best friend. We'll join the friends on that. And then we'll go and fetch their name and their best friend's name. Um, this would work. We could build this. By the way, I'm also not a SQL engineer. That almost certainly isn't valid SQL. It's fine. The concept is there. So why wouldn't we do this? We're done, right? We've built it. End of presentation. Well. There are a couple of things that about this that just like don't quite click with me. The first one is a little bit these joins, because this assumes that we can efficiently run the joins across all of this. And if this is all in one SQL database, that might work. But you can imagine as this grows to 
as a hypothetical social network, billions of users, maybe we're not just running one giant SQL database. Maybe we're going to need to shard this across multiple DBs, and suddenly these joins aren't looking quite as trivial. But that's a very technical answer for why we shouldn't build it this way. I actually think there's a conceptual reason why we wouldn't build it this way too, which is that sort of sequence of joins, that sequence of tables and how they connected, isn't how I think about this app. When I describe this app to you, if I were going to describe it, I would say, we're going to fetch the logged in user. That's me. And then we're going to go and we're going to fetch that person's friends, and we're going to fetch that person's best friend. And then for each of their friends, we're going to fetch their name. And then for each of those friends, we're going to fetch their best friend. This is how I start to think about the app. This is sort of what gets created. And it translates fairly reasonably into an underlying query. I'll use Redis here as an example, also not a Redis engineer. But you can imagine the get going out, a get and a range, a bunch more gets and a bunch more gets. And we can see, if we were building it this way, what would emerge. What are the actual like, Redis hits that we're going to do? And one of the nice things that emerges from here is we realize that our data requirements form a tree. When we think about our data requirements, when we describe our data requirements, that's the shape that they take. And I don't think that's a coincidence. Because when we think about our apps, when we think about our views, when we think about our interactions, they very often also form a tree. And that tree doesn't just describe the shape of our app. That tree also describes our data fetching strategy. And if I go back to this, there are actually some really nice optimizations that we can do here. You can imagine these five friends, the ones that we're fetching all at the same time, there's actually no reason why we would do five round trips to a DB in order to fetch them. We have all five of those IDs at once. So it'd be really nice if we did that in one round trip. And we would do something like an mget in Redis. And then similarly, with these five friends, we can do the same thing, and we can optimize the heck out of this thing. And if you're familiar at all with Data Loader, this is exactly what Data Loader does in JS. And the reason Data Loader exists is because there was a corresponding uh, abstraction within Facebook called Loader. And we were talking with folks about GraphQL, and they're like, well, how do you solve this problem? And our answer was, what do you mean, how do you solve this problem? This problem's already solved. There's an underlying abstraction. There's a thing that GraphQL can compose with in order to do this well. And there are a bunch more interesting optimizations that we can do here. And one of the talks I'm really excited about for uh, later in the next two days is Andy's talk, because he's going to dive really deep into this in great detail, including how the GraphQL spec addresses it. But one really critical thing, before we even dive that deep, because I'm just touching the surface here, is this layer of the tree. Because this layer of the tree, we're trying to fetch the friends, and we're trying to fetch the best friend. And we don't need to block on one before the other. We don't need to wait for the friends to come back to go to the best friend. But these are also two different queries. This isn't really a data loader style problem. How exactly are we going to solve it? And in particular, how are we going to solve it in actually writing the code? Because that's one thing I've completely elided so far. We haven't had actually written code to do this data fetching. And the realization that we had repeatedly is that we have to design our servers around asynchronicity. That is just critical to making sure that our servers are going to be efficient and that we're going to be able to build the app that I described using the efficient queries that I described. One challenge we ran into, uh, this is 2008, I think, is where I started that timeline. So we were using PHP 5. PHP 5 in 2008 did not have good asynchronous primitives. And so we made do. So let's imagine this is, you know, this is the query pattern we're trying to get. This is sort of the thing we want to see in our Redis logs if we got everything right. What are we actually going to write in 2008 era PHP? Well, our initial stab would just be this. Just get the data. And this, of course, will do 13 round trips, because every time we call a get, we're actually going to go and hit this get as a synchronous call. So what could we do instead without asynchronous primitives? Well, one thing we could do is we could say get doesn't actually issue the round trip. Get queues up the round trip. And then I'll add a magic function, call it dispatch, and that will actually do the round trip. And so you queue everything up, you call dispatch, and that actually goes and hits Redis. Um, this seems kind of concocted and seems kind of fake. Uh, this is pretty much what our code in 2008 would have looked like. This true that's at the end, that says, hey, that get call that was supposed to be synchronous, don't make it synchronous. Like, make it async instead. And that additional parameter, that third parameter, is a reference variable that, when it actually gets fulfilled, will get filled in. And if this seems confusing, don't worry, it gets worse. <laughs> but I want to really strongly emphasize, this was not hypothetical. This is actually what we did. Because asynchronousity was that important to us. We knew we had to do this in order to make the app run efficiently. And so we did. Uh, it wasn't good. 
So we iterated, and we improved. And we came up with something that we called preparable. And a preparable basically said, OK, instead of having a single magic function that says dispatch everything all at once, the preparable says, I'm a function that has multiple stages of fetching. So I'll put the first stage in case zero of a switch statement in a magic function. I'll put the second stage that requires the first stage to be done in stage one. And again, you eventually get used to this, but not really. But this was something that we used very, very heavily throughout the app. I mean, it's something we talked about on Quora. It's up there. And it's something that we gave talks about. This is a slide from a talk that we gave on preparables uh, in 2011. And when I say we here, I'm using you know, a little bit the royal we and a little bit we as Facebook. Uh, but I also can use it as we, the creators of GraphQL, I guess, because this talk was given by Nick Schrock in 2011, talking about preparable and talking about really a lot of the things that I'm covering here. And I'm starting to hint at you know, the evolution of GraphQL, what created, it didn't emerge from sort of this primordial void. It emerged from these problems that we were solving in Facebook server architecture, problems like asynchronicity that we were solving with Preparable. So going back to Preparable, um, unless you worked at Facebook, this probably looks rather unfamiliar, with one exception. Uh, if you ever played with Regenerator, which allowed you to use sort of function stars in JavaScript, and it would effectively compile it into something that didn't use function stars, this is what the output looked like. It looks a lot like Preparable, and that's not by coincidence. Really, all Preparable was was a way of implementing generators, which you can sort of simulate async functions with, when you didn't actually have generators in the language. So in conclusion, we were taking our functions, we were turning them into objects. The state of those objects was literally what we now consider the output of a compile step, because who would write this manually? And this was the state of the art in 2010 or 2011. And I want to further emphasize, this is exactly what we did. We did this, because asynchronousy was still that important. We had to do it in order to make our server run the way we wanted to. We spent so much time iterating on these async primitives. Uh, and the good news is you don't have to, because all we were doing was building async await. And async await exists now. And virtually every language that I would consider using for a server has async await. And if that sounds like a slight dig at Python or Ruby, yeah, OK. <laughs> and why do I like async await so much? Why do I think it's so good? Well, this code that we wrote, that's pretty much what we wanted to write. It's pretty good. I can read that code. I mean, this is a hypothetical app with no designer and that I just explained 10 minutes ago. You can read that code and go, yeah, I know what that does. And that's a really important principle, and it's one that certainly the memcache dispatch and the preparable did not have. Well, with async await, you still have that. You're just fetching the data. You're bundling the things you want to do in one round trip. You can compose these things as you'd like. It's just pretty. It's really nice. I like it. Um, and I'm going to violate the laws of sort of time here, because I'm supposed to be talking about 2008 to 2012, uh, and I might be dating myself, but I'm going to do like a season three lost thing where we just like flash forward, and we're going all the way from 2008 to 2012 to uh, last month. Because I said async await's really good, and async await is really good. I like the code a lot, but this line never quite sat well with me. It feels kind of awkward. And it's not awkward in a slide format, because you can usually simplify it down, and this makes sense. But you know, this is the equivalent of what it would look like in PHP. It's not that ugly. It's just dollar signs. But ultimately, your app grows. And you do more and more things at this function. And the function ends up looking a little bit more like this than you would like. And this is ugly. This is twice as many lines of code as it needs to be. You can't really follow what's going on. And I'm also doing that trick that speakers always do, where they show a bug on a slide and then see how many people spotted it while they were talking. Show of hands. It's there. I messed this up. I assigned the additional data to extra, and I assigned the extra data to additional. I don't know if I would have caught that in code review. I hope I would have caught that in unit tests, but I probably would have caught that in production. right? <laughs> This isn't really what we want to be coding. And the good news there is we are trying to solve this in the hack language in HHVM with a new keyword, concurrent, that basically takes this code, which has a very, obvious, or has a very subtle bug in it, and you would write this instead. And you would write these five things, and they would all run concurrently. And at least in my mind, the bug is very easy to spot now. It's like extra equals additional. It's like, yeah, that's wrong. I messed this up. Um, so this is really cool. Uh, why am I talking about this? 
I want to make it very clear, I had nothing to do with building this. I just think it's super cool. And in particular, I've been saying asynchronicity, it was that important. It was that important in that era. It is still that important that in 2019, we are still iterating on our server architecture to make sure that we get it right more often than we get it wrong. And so this is a lesson that I took away from that. You really want to design your server abstractions around async primitives. And one of the things that I've learned this hard way is anytime you design it around sync primitives and someone decides they need to make it async in the future, which they will, that's really hard. It's a lot easier to call synchronous code from asynchronous code than vice versa. And so this is one lesson that I've taken away over and over again is if it can ever be async, make it async. And if it can't, you're probably wrong and it should be async anyway. <laughs> and when I say you should design your server abstractions around async primitives, uh, I'm talking a little bit from experience here because GraphQL did. Uh, so if you all turn your hymnals to the book of GraphQL, chapter 6, verse 4.2, uh, we'll read responsibly. This is the value resolution section. Uh, it's small type, but we all have it memorized, so it's fine. In case you don't, here it is. No, that's small type. I'm going to need to go over here to read it. This one I'm going to read out loud because it's important. It is common for Resolver to be asynchronous due to relying on reading an underlying database or network service to produce a value. This necessitates the rest of a GraphQL executor to handle an asynchronous execution flow. The GraphQL executor's got to be asynchronous because your server abstractions are going to be asynchronous. They need to be. Design it around asynchronicity. The final lesson that we learned was to strive for single sources of truth whenever possible. And I want to flash back to these four questions, because these are the four questions that I said I was going to answer at the start of the talk. I was going to explain how Facebook server architecture handled these. But I actually want to sort of look at these four questions and think of something different, because I didn't really answer them. But when we go to answer them, when we decide, OK, it's time we're going to solve these, these questions are really important. Authorization, authentication, you've got to get it right. You're looking at caching? If you don't get caching right, is that going to take down one of your DBs? Right? You're trying to detect people who are spamming. You've got rate limiting. You don't want to get that right 90% of the time. You want to get it right all of the time. And if we always want to get things right, we only want to write them once. Right? If we wrote it twice, one of like three things happens in my experience. Either the first implementation's wrong, the second one's wrong, or they're both wrong. Very rarely are they both, you wrote it, twi you wrote it twice, and you happen to get it exactly right both times. And so the solution that we had at Facebook here, these single sources of truth, uh, are what I would call smart data objects, if I were speaking in generalities. Uh, if you're ever talking to a Facebooker and they sound super obsessed with Lord of the Rings because they're constantly talking about Ents, um, they might be obsessed with Lord of the Rings. They're almost certainly referencing these objects at Facebook. We know them as Ents. It's short for Entity. And there's a lot to that abstraction, but it actually kind of fits on a slide a lot of the critical pieces, because this is really what one of those smart data objects would look like. It's just a class. In this case, it's in JavaScript, but you know, we have it in PHP or in Hacklang. And that class has this static gen method. And this gen method returns a promise, asynchronicity is important, of a nullable smart user. It's saying, hey, if you tell me who you are, give me your viewer, and you give me an idea of a user, uh, I will go and asynchronously get that user, and I will return it to you if I can. And this is important because that return it to you if I can, I'm fetching the user. This is where we can put a lot of those hard questions I mentioned earlier. We're trying to figure out where to put authorization. You put it here, because if this is the only way of getting a smart user, if you're in a language that lets you actually hide the constructor, then everyone who has a smart user object has to go through this. I mentioned caching. If you're going to integrate data loader into your stack, where would you put it? You can put it here. Rate limiting? How do you detect any time someone's fetching a user? Well, they're always going through this method. This is our single source of truth for fetching a user. And then this object you can also sort of augment with additional capabilities. You can have these methods that basically say, hey, a user has a best friend. You should be able to fetch that thing. Again, an asynchronous promise that returns a nullable user. They might have a profile photo. Same thing. And Notably, these smart data objects, all of their methods stay in that universe. They stay in the smart data object universe, and they use these gen methods as well. And so gen best friend, is that going through the single source of truth? Yes, definitionally, because the only way to get a user is to call that gen method, so this method has to be implemented using it. So I know when I call this method, 
because it returns a smart user object, because I'm getting this, I know it's gone through the single source of truth. So this has two benefits. One of them is it avoids overfetching. I included that profile photo example. My mock was terrible. It didn't have any photos in it. I don't need to fetch that data for the mock. And if I'm using these objects, I don't. Because if I never call gen profile photo, I never run that asynchronous method, I never hit the DB. I've avoided overfetching. And secondly, and I think this is something that is subtle but really important, we have built-in preconditions. Imagine you don't have a single source of truth, and you're writing a method, and you're like, OK, I want to get passed in a user, but uh, you need to have already done a rate-limiting check on that user before I can use it, because I'm not going to do it in my method. It doesn't make sense for whatever reason. So you would write that in a doc block. And all of your callers would read your doc block diligently and go, oh, I better do the rate limiting check or else something's going to go wrong. That's definitely what would happen in every code base I've seen. Now, like you can write your preconditions in doc blocks, but you'll get it right some of the time, which isn't really what you want from a precondition. The nice things about these objects are you basically write your preconditions in the type signature of the method. If you give me a smart user object, I know you've rate limited it. And I know that because you went through the single source of truth to fetch it, and that thing did the rate limiting for me. And so it gives you a little bit of peace of mind, where you're like, hey, because I'm operating at this layer, I know that all the things I needed to do, all the things that needed to happen, have happened because the single source of truth guaranteed it. So this is where things might start to be looking a little bit eerily familiar. Because if I look at this class and I squint a little bit, it looks really familiar. It's kind of a GraphQL object type, right? Like this class. And these, these methods that I described that asynchronously maybe return another one of these types, those are just GraphQL fields that return objects. And that gen method, that's a root field, right? You put that on query. It's going to give you a user, given a viewer and an ID. It'll take an ID as a parameter. And this isn't by coincidence. The reason why this looks really familiar and why the concepts in GraphQL correspond so nicely to this is because that's what existed at Facebook in January of 2012 when we were building GraphQL. We had these smart data objects, and so we built GraphQL as a wrapper around them. And so one question that I'll occasionally hear is, OK, we have these resolvers. Are resolvers what should contain your business logic? And I generally advise no. Resolvers shouldn't contain your business logic. Resolvers should map to your business logic. If you look at the resolvers at Facebook, they are generally very, very thin and or non-existent, as you'll hear later today. Because we want the business logic to be in a single place. It's a thin API layer. And I think that's an important concept. The reason why GraphQL doesn't answer any of these four questions is not by omission. It's by design. So this has been GraphQL before GraphQL, sort of that initial four years, and it really goes even before that, but leading up to February 2012, that put us in a place where, you know, with three people sitting at a pod of desks trying to build this thing out in two weeks, we had the underlying infrastructure. We had a lot of the underlying concepts that would allow us to build that initial prototype that would make us go, okay, there might be something here. And those principles, those principles that existed, the idea that our data requirements form a tree, the design around asynchronicity, and the striving for single sources of truth, that's very clear in the GraphQL spec and in the design of GraphQL implementations. You know, the data requirements form a tree. I don't even know how to expound on that. That is just so tautological in GraphQL. It's, you know, that input query is a tree. The design around asynchronicity, the, the idea that in the executor, yeah, everything could be asynchronous and we have to handle that. This idea of striving for a single source of truth, which, you know, the resolvers allow us to very cleanly map and say, every time I'm fetching a user's name, it goes through this method. And I know that because I wrote it right there. Uh, last year, not on this stage, on the previous stage, the one that only fit 400 instead of 800, Nick Schrock talked about GraphQL native servers and the need to design our servers around GraphQL. And I think these three principles really sort of define, in my mind, what a GraphQL native server would look like. They have to answer all these because if they don't, GraphQL is not going to click. It's not going to fit in because GraphQL is designed to work with a server that thinks like this. And what the shape of that server is, is going to completely vary. You know, I will happily expound, if you find me in the room over there, on the benefits of a monolith. I'll talk about that all day. I love them. But it doesn't have to be a monolith. You can easily hit all three of these principles with a non-monolith, and plenty of people have. And so I think that, to me, is really key, is when we talk about this GraphQL native design, we want to make sure that we're hitting the underlying principles.
Uh, one thing I'm really excited about today uh, is the fact that, you know, I spent all this time talking about the creation of 2012 era Facebook server architecture. There have been seven years of evolution since then on that original GraphQL native server. Uh, and so the fact that we've got two talks from people who are working on a Facebook server during this conference gets me really excited. Uh, and I'm also excited for our next talk because in addition to talking about GraphQL native servers, we can talk a little bit about the clients. Uh, we can talk a little bit about the original GraphQL native client, the Facebook iOS app and the Facebook Android app. Uh, and so I'm excited to hand it over to Matt Mahoney, who's going to be talking about how to scale them. Thank you. <laughs>